my friend. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what to do. I can't so remember. I was like being so like trying to be so tech savvy and trying to get this on my actual computer because it's like bigger uh, than everything. And then it logged me out oh, and no. changed my password. Oh no. Okay. But, that's all right. That's okay. Sorry. It happens. It happens. Only 104. <laughs> What's that? It's only 104 and I was able to get on. So You're, It's perfectly fine. But we have until two. So I'm going to start from the top. Okay. I'm Dr. Shannon Clark and I am being joined by Dr. Allison Rogers, uh, social media extraordinaire uh, and also fertility specialist. You're at the Fertility Center of Illinois in Chicago, correct? That's right. Is it still cold there or is it getting better? Well, well, I mean, it was like 90s in June, in the beginning of June, like really oh, hot. And now, I mean, you know, I lived in San Antonio, so I'm used to San Antonio yeah. heat also. Yeah. But now it's been like lovely, you know, 70. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that anytime. Now, do you have headphones on? No, do you want me to put some in? You might want to put some in because um, you're, you're breaking up since I have them in. Well, yeah. Let me let me get them on. Okay. Maybe that'll help. Your voice is kind of dropping out a little bit. Oh. Much better. Much better. Okay. Great. Okay. So what we're what we're going to discuss today is male factor infertility and secondary infertility. And in an, in an attempt to be inclusive, which I've been working on daily, we're also Me going too. to refer to sperm, sperm producing partner infertility, for infertility, which could apply to those who don't identify as, men, as males. So interchangeably, male factor infertility, and we'll go back and forth throughout this discussion, uh, along with sperm producing partner infertility. So let's just hit it. Male factor infertility, sperm producing partner infertility. Um, I got some stats, and you tell me if I'm right, about 10% of infertility can be attributed to the sperm producing partner, and then about 35% involve both the sperm producing and the egg producing partners. So overall, about almost half of couples with infertility may have male factor or sperm producing partner infertility. Is that correct? Yeah, and some of the data is like up to 20% male okay. factor alone. Can you hear? I've got, a, I've got an awesome resident with me today. Oh. <laughs> Uh, hi. <laughs> hi there. Yeah, so, so that could, uh, nice to you meet can you. can also sit in this office right there. <laughs> yeah, she wants to hear, so she's going to go Perfect. to another office so she can turn her volume okay. on. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so I looked up what overall what some stats would be about what causes male factor or sperm producing partner infertility. Um, I think traditionally it's uh, the egg producing partner or female partner is usually the one to blame, but we know that that's not the case. So right. what are the most common causes of male factor or sperm producing partner infertility? So we think about trouble with, you know, it's not quite as uh, well-defined, right? Male factor, okay. you know, if a, a normal semen analysis doesn't mean the sperm are functioning normal, even mm -hmm. though it, it's usually a good sign. So we use a semen analysis sort of as a marker of sperm production, hormone profiles, you know, if everything's working right, we should have good quality sperm. But even in those situations, sometimes sperm, for example, have a hard time getting into the egg, getting through cervical mucus, even mm -hmm. if the semen analysis may be normal. So we do use semen analysis. The three main things we look at are the count, so the number of sperm, the motility, so what percentage of the sperm are moving, and then morphology, so normally mm -hmm. shaped sperm. And then, of course, we also look at sexual function. There are a lot of couples who see me who have trouble with sexual function, sometimes mm -hmm. from the female perspective, but a lot of times also from the male perspective. And, you know, females just need sperm deposited inside them. Males actually have to make sure that they're ejaculating. And so if there's a lot of men who have trouble ejaculating for a variety of hormonal, anatomic, you know, emotional reasons, and then that's also a type of infertility. They can have a normal semen analysis and normal hormones, but if they can't, ejaculate, then that's also mm -hmm. infertility. So mm -hmm. I think those are the sort of the main things, ability to perform, you know, and ejaculate, and then also sort of quality of sperm. Yeah, so some of the stats that I got to, because you know, I'm a stats person, about 30 to 40% of cases are due to problems within the testes, which would, I mm. assume it would include the actual production of the sperm and the sperm morphology itself. Then 10 to 20% are due to a blockage in the pathway. So talk real quick, what how does the sperm get to be in the ejaculate? Talk about that, because that's what we talked about. Start it, from the beginning, and how yeah, is it? Yeah, so we think, we think a lot yeah. about um, 
females, right? And all the hormones that are needed to create a good lining of the uterus to help uh, egg get released, help, you know, open fallopian tubes. Well, you also need a functioning reproductive tract in men. And I, I wonder if that statistic is also related to what we call azospermia, which is a complete lack of sperm. Yes. So when we have a complete, absolutely no sperm, you know, the question for us is, is there a blockage or is the sperm not being produced? And so the sperm are produced in the testicles themselves. And they start off, I don't know if any of you guys follow me for sperm Mondays, but I haven't mm -hmm. done one recently of like uh, immature sperm, we call it a round cell. So sperm actually start off their life cycles as little circles, and then they grow their tail as they mature. And they go through the several glands, but mainly the vas deferens, which helps bring the sperm, and I bet I have a picture around here, but bring the sperm from the testicles themselves through, through the prostate, through the other glands, and then out through the urethra, where, where the semen itself is composed of the sperm, plus the rest of the ejaculate, which is um, secretions from the other glands in the male reproductive tract. And so these glands, I know we don't really think about them very much, but produce mm -hmm. the sort of um, basic environment. And I'm, I, I feel like I should probably have some videos and some pictures, but I may not have them right on me. Mm -hmm. But um, oh, here, look. Right. Oh, here. nice. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So, right. The testicles are here and the sperm are produced. This is the epididymis, which where the sperm get their tails and they go, that goes through the vas deferens, which sort of goes up and around and through the prostate here and, uh, and out through the urethra out as ejaculate. So there's a lot of different, um, it, it kind of goes on a journey itself to get out. And so you're right. When we see a, a, a semen sample with zero sperm in it, it can be coming from a situation mm -hmm. where there's, you know, a hormone issue where the man isn't making any sperm because of a hormone imbalance. We think about things actually like the most common one I see actually is recreational testosterone use. So mm -hmm. guys, who, we're going to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. So guys who use testosterone, it kills all their yeah. sperm production. We think about things that are obstructive. So we think about things like cystic fibrosis carriers or men with cystic fibrosis. They usually have absence of that vas deferens, that little tube that carries the sperm out. And they are making great sperm in the testicles. They just have no way to get it into the ejaculate. So just like so, the female reproductive tract or egg producing partner tract, we need functioning ovaries, functioning tubes, functioning uterus, cervix. It, it's a process where the egg is carried through. The same can, thing can be said for sperm. So any uh, congenital defect, which means congenital means a defect that a person is born with that happened during the formation of the fetus. Um, anything in that along the reproductive tract of a male can do similar things. So, so that's something to consider. And we don't hardly ever talk about that, but that does happen. There are abnormalities and congenital, congenital abnormalities of the Absolutely. reproductive tract of a male. Yeah. Yes. And you know, I think that maybe sperm even have a longer journey, because if you think yes. about it, they not only have to like, go through their whole process of maturation, but they also have to then get to the female reproductive tract, get through the cervix, get up to the tubes, find the egg, mm -hmm. get into the egg, yeah. so they even have more to do. <laughs> That's true. That is true. And Obviously, then similar... No, so, so we're, real quick, similar to if we, we've heard about chlamydia, having a, an effect on the tubes, potentially causing a blockage in the tubes there. Are there any kind of sexually transmitted diseases or infections that could similarly affect the sperm producing partner's reproductive tract? So it's not as much with like sexually transmitted infections, okay. but we do think about infections, things like mumps, which we don't see a whole lot these days, but like, you know, due to vaccination. <laughs> right. So, you know, there's all this controversy about like, you know, about the COVID, you know, infection and vaccination and like, how many people does COVID really kill? Well, let me tell you, mumps doesn't kill hardly anybody. Yeah. I think it's like one in a hundred thousand people. Why are we all vaccinated for mumps? It causes male infertility. Yes. It is destructive, just like other viruses in our, in our world that we want to not yes. have long-term good to have. from, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So mumps is a, one of those classic things. And I do from time to time have guys who are either older who have not been vaccinated or a lot mm -hmm. of people from other countries who've not been yeah. vaccinated. They didn't we have access to vaccines, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so though, like mumps is a big one. Sometimes, you know, because it causes what we call orchiitis, so like an inflammation and infection in the testicles, high fevers uh, as a child sometimes can cause sort of damage. It's not 
luckily, luckily probably, it's not as much sexually transmitted good, uh, good. infections that cause blockage, but there can, there can be some sort of infectious processes that can cause issues long term mm -hmm. with sperm production. Um, and then going along with the stats, one to two percent are due to pituitary uh, problems with the pituitary hypothalamus, which is a central production. And that's uh, we think about things in the brain or what we call central um, that can cause uh, abnormalities of hormone production, which can, which can affect egg and or sperm production. Right. And then so just like females, yeah, right, yeah. like pro elevated prolactin yeah. levels from prolactinomas. Yes. A lot of times those guys present with sexual dysfunction um, mm -hmm. and other sort of pituitary issues, just like in women. Uh, yeah. It's really yeah. important for your pituitary to send all those signals down to either ovary right. or, or right. testicle to create, you know, either eggs or do what I'm supposed to do. And then 40 to 50 percent percent has have no identifiable cause, which I know is hard to a hard statistic to swallow, if you will. Um, and we, everybody wants to have a reason or a diagnosis, but unfortunately there's up to 50% that don't have a diagnosis, correct? Yeah. And I do think there's certainly medications that can sometimes yeah. cause issues yes. with sperm function. And we think about things like, you know, medicines for gout and mm -hmm. medicines like calcium channel blockers that are great medicines for blood pressure control, which of course mm -hmm. is so important. Don't stop your yeah. blood pressure medicine, talk to your doctor. But remember sperm sort of get into the egg with these calcium channels and functional mm -hmm. calcium. And so calcium channels. So if you're on a calcium channel blocker, which is great for blood pressure, it may create a scenario where your sperm are not able to get into cells. And yeah. so mm -hmm. there are a lot of things also lifestyle. I think that, yeah. you know, people, there's a lot of people who have issues with excess weight that can mm -hmm. cause our fat cells create estrogen, and that can cause some hormone mm -hmm. imbalances. Also men who are very large have a lot of, uh, you know, tissue in that area. And a lot of times testicles mm -hmm. can get too hot um, mm -hmm. because they're sort of trapped between legs or bellies or, you know, um, mm -hmm. and uh, high weight men can often, uh, or sperm producing individuals can often have testicles that get too hot from being sort of mm -hmm. trapped inside uh, when they should be yeah. more outside. Mm -hmm. um, and we think about things like smoking, you know, marijuana, nicotine, um, mm -hmm. you know, and excessive yeah. alcohol, caffeine, that kind of stuff can affect sperm quality. So uh, is, those are all, all the things you just mentioned are all on my risk factors list. Uh, we've awesome. already talked about the in, some of the endocrine and central type balance, balances. Uh, injury, obviously, injury to the testicle, or if it's not, if it's under too much heat, um, due to some of the things that Dr. Rogers just mentioned, that can also, affect production as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, heat can come from right, like taking baths, saunas, yeah. um, hot tubs, and we also think about excessive bicycle riding. So yeah. I'm not talking about hopping on your Peloton 20 to 30 minutes a day. I'm yeah. talking yeah. about like. Yes, These guys who spend like eight hours every Saturday on trails mm -hmm. with their buddies, you know, we actually can see some sperm um, issues and, and abnormal yeah. semen analysis with that. Yeah. And then one other thing I wanted to ask you about, and you touched on this, the recreational or non-recreational use of testosterone and other steroids. That is something that we have to consider, especially in our, our younger individuals. Can there be because uh, I know when uh, there's a, a, a male or a sperm producing partner who is young, the last thing they're worried about is becoming a parent. They may be doing this for a long term, but long enough, it can have long term effects, correct? Yeah. So when we're talking about recreational testosterone use, yeah. it's mainly something that is not gotten from a, a physician. Yes, um, yes. Although I will tell you, I have patients, I've had patients over the years who have told their doctors they're trying to get pregnant. They're having maybe trouble with sexual function. Their doctor checks their testosterone level. Their testosterone's mm -hmm. low. And a very well-intentioned family doctor, yeah. internist, or even sometimes urologist who doesn't know anything yeah. about the infertility places them on testosterone thinking it's going to help them. And then, mm -hmm. you know, and then what happens is that they shut off all sperm production. Yeah. So I've also had yeah. this happen with a lot of like naturopathic doctors and stuff like that yeah. um, from patients. Yeah. And I do believe it's coming from a place of well intention. But if your testosterone mm -hmm. level is low, then actually it seems so like counterintuitive that actually giving testosterone would make it worse. Um, it actually raises the testosterone level, but it kills the sperm production. Yeah. So um, there's other medicines we use. Yes, yes. Okay. So it's important, especially when considering future fertility. My word of caution would be if you are diagnosed with low testosterone or someone drew a testosterone level on you for whatever reason, there could be a whole gazillion reasons why they did that. Before you start taking 
exogenous testosterone, talk to a fertility specialist first. Because even if you're not planning on having a family or starting a family soon, just get their opinion. Because what's done in the immediate period could affect what happens in their future. Would that be safe to say? Yeah, I think that part of it is sort of like, part of it has to do with like the cause like yeah. why is it well, well you got to find out the cause obviously find out the cause yeah, yeah i will important. say that most recreational testosterone use typically guys ha are have normal testosterone yeah. when they start it and yeah. it's usually reversible it takes a good three plus months to really yeah, see a reverse okay. and i'll tell you it's like the most rewarding type of fertility yeah. care you meet with a couple yeah. and i actually had someone recently who was like no, my partner's fine. He's had kids before. I don't think he needs to be screened. Clearly it's me. And then I'm like, yeah, so when we do treatment, we screen everybody as recommended mm -hmm. by the American yeah. Society of Reproductive Medicine. He had no sperm, none, zero. Wow. And he was taking recreational testosterone. I think there's a mm -hmm. lot of people who might not tell their partners about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and he stopped it and she got pregnant. And it's wow. like amazing, right? So That's but it, crazy, does, yeah. it does take some time. And also when I have guys in that situation, I will have them work with one of my reproductive urology mm -hmm. colleagues. Okay. A lot of times we'll start them on injections, not of testosterone, but of like LH and FSH to mm -hmm. sort of get their testicles wo woken back up because they're kind of yeah. put to sleep. Yeah, so yeah. From the excess, usually yeah. it's reversible, um, but it takes a while. Okay. And then you also touched on lifestyle habits. We know obviously t smoking is not going to be good for reproduction in the male and the egg or the sperm producing partner. It's just not right. You already touched on alcohol consumption. You also talked about exposure to heat in the different ways that exposing the testicles to heat can decrease sperm production. Um, I'm going to make you talk about marijuana because I, I get asked that all the time. And I, I, what I think it is, is they think it's because it's natural I love the word natural. It's, I've always used air quotes because natural has so many different meanings now. Yes, it's natural and that it, it grows, you can grow it naturally, but there are consequences of it. Can marijuana affect sperm production? So it's interesting. There's a lot of controversy about this. I will tell yes. you, I live in Illinois. Illinois, uh, marijuana is legal uh, for, mm -hmm. you know, there's, disp it's kind of like kind of weird, but over the last couple of years, there's like dispensaries, kind of like drugstores yeah. all over the, yeah. All yeah. Over the place. People just walk in. Yeah. Um, and what I will first say, smoking anything, whether it's yeah. nicotine or marijuana is going to cause lung cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, there haven't been a ton of studies about marijuana and lung cancer, but like smoking, burning leaves is going to cause lung cancer. So I don't recommend anybody smoke marijuana in terms of using edibles. Um, there's a lot of a lot of patients I see who take edibles and there's some controversy because there's been mm -hmm. some studies showing that it may have some binding to estrogen receptors yeah. It may, yeah. um, you know, reduce sperm quality. And then there's some other studies that looked at um, marijuana use saying that maybe it doesn't, I will say for general health, um, you know, uh, probably not a great idea when you're trying to get pregnant of taking yeah. anything your body doesn't need. Well, the good thing with, uh, and it's going to take some time, but having these states that are making marijuana legal is that we're going to be able to study it e more easily, which yeah. is the upside. And we're going to be able to, especially in places like where you live. I'm in Texas. We don't, we don't, it's not legal yet. Hopefully one day it will be. Um, but being able to study makes a huge difference because before when it was legal, you know, across the nation, you couldn't study these, these uh, individuals. No, so now we're, like we'll at least get the data. We'll get the data. So yeah. that's, that is the upside of this is, is being able to get that data. So you talked about, you know, the physical exam, talk about the physical exam and getting the history, obviously, what are you taking? And as someone who is a male or sperm producing individual, when you go in for a fertility workup as a couple or as an individual, you got to be completely transparent and forthcoming with what you're taking in because it could be something totally innocuous that you think has nothing to do. And Dr. Rogers is going to say, wait a minute, <laughs> that might yeah. be what the issue is. So being yeah. able to tell them exactly what you're taking, any dietary habits, any physical activities, like, sh like she mentioned, long term, long distance bike riding where my husband trained for a triathlon. He was on his bike 12 hours a day. Now right. we weren't trying to conceive at the time, but I'm sure if he had had a, a semen analysis, there would have been an issue, no question. So those types of things you had to be completely forthright with. Talk a little bit about the physical exam. What are you looking for on a physical exam when a, a sperm producing individual comes into your office for a fertility workup? 
Yeah. So just to talk about sort of the, um, you know, the history taking portion, which I yeah. do want every uh, sperm producing partner sure. that I have in the office is, you know, I do ask really personal questions that maybe yeah. other doctors and other people that like how, you know, are you having trouble with erections? Do you have any history yeah. of testicular trauma? So we kind of go through it all. In terms of exams, I will say as an OBGYN, I don't do a whole lot of physical exams, but I do have my reproductive urology colleagues do. Okay. One of the things that they're looking for is, of course, they're looking to see the size of the testicles. And um, sometimes if there's hormone imbalances or there's low testosterone levels, the, testos the testicles can be small. Um, and so they're looking for the size of the testicles. They're looking for any nodules on the testicles. They're looking to feel the vas deferens, which is um, that cord that produces, that sort of delivers the sperm into the ejaculate. And then they're also looking for varicosities that are large enough they can be uh, palpated or, or, you know, found on physical exam. A lot of times varicose veins in the scrotum are very common. Um, and we see these, um, you know, on a relatively you know regular basis and they they can because varicose veins create a lot of heat yeah they can cause a lot of heat and cause issues with sperm production as well as like mm -hmm. hormonal production mm -hmm. um and we often will see this on the left side because um just from an anatomy perspective the left side the left testicular vein is longer because mm -hmm. it comes off of the renal vein as opposed to the vena cava so on the, which happens on the right. So we do see a lot of left-sided uh, varicoceles and we sometimes mm -hmm. will do ultrasounds to find these, but are, mm -hmm. you know, but luckily I, you know, as a gynecologist, I'm, I'm not having to do a whole lot of yeah. exams. So. But, but, but the exam, but the exam, the point is the exam is important. The physical exam Absolutely. is very important when doing a workup. And even though it's Dr. Rogers, you, you said you, you they're called a uh, reproductive urologist. So are there, are urologists that specialize or have a, so yeah. in so there okay. are fellowship trained reproductive oh. urologists. Um, it's okay. typically a one to two year fellowship. Nice. I don't think it's like um, one of the certified fellowships yet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sometimes they're like, so they're either called reproductive urology or um, and like andrology, um, mm -hmm. an andrology okay. fellowship. And these are urologists that really focus on sort of the hormonal aspects. They more or less okay. do what I do for men. And so mm -hmm. it's really important. I, work, I have lots of great relationships living in Chicago. Of course, we have yeah. lots of reproductive urologists, which is so fantastic for our patients, of course. Yeah. Not every place does. So sometimes right. regular general urologists have to take that role on. But I really think like if, if you have, a, if you're a patient who needs to have, for example, a testicular sperm extraction, which we may be getting mm -hmm. to, but where we need to get sperm right from the testicles because of a blockage or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, you, there's a lot of different techniques out there. You really want to be with someone who does a lot yeah, of these procedures lot of and mm -hmm. they do it in a, in a microscopic way, meaning they um, look with loops and find, they go through the little, uh, you know, seminiferous vesicles in a very delicate, detailed way and are able to find these um, little, you know, vesicles that look healthier and then they're able to remove those and those have a better chance of having sperm. If you're just going with someone who's like just taking a random biopsy, like, mm. like, you know, th that's really not considered standard of care anymore. And so okay. this is the kind of thing that you really want to make sure you're with somebody who knows what they're doing. That, that's really good to know. I didn't even realize until recently that there were uh, urologists that were specializing in that, which I think is excellent. It's, yeah. uh, it's definitely the hard, a plus the only for the downside is that the, sometimes they're hard to find depending on where you live. Yeah. I mean, yeah. same with reproductive yeah. endocrinologists, probably same with MFM, exactly. right? Like, yes, exactly. you know, any of yeah. the subspecialties, uh, specialists are going to be more in cities. Okay. Um, we talked about the structural abnormalities of the reproductive tract already. Um, we also talked about, well, you mentioned a little bit, some of the ejaculatory disorders, of course. Um, and you, it's kind of piggybacks onto what you just said. If there's a problem with ejaculation, they have to actually go in and retrieve the sperm from the testes. That would be one of the indications to do that, right? If there's an ejaculatory problem. So I will say uh, most of our patients who have a trouble ejaculating with intercourse are able to ejaculate on their own Okay. okay. most of the time. Now, when they're not, a lot of times we can give them hormones to help help with that. Gotcha. Um, but uh, most, and there is a lot of reasons, um, but some men just are unable to ejaculate with regular intercourse. And I think it becomes really stressful. And it's truthfully not something people want to talk about with yeah. like, it's not something people talk about or, mm -hmm. you know, you know, discuss, but I see it a lot. 
Mm-hmm. And I, you know, part of me is like, you know, you hear, you know, you hear stuff on social media, which I don't know, is I, like, there's not real science behind it. Like, you know, this like rumor of like, if guys masturbate too much, then they have a hard time, yeah. you know, same with women, right? Like, you know, there's this sort of rumor. I don't know if that's really true. Um, mm-hmm. I certainly think that there are probably some people who have a lot of anxiety associated with mm-hmm. intercourse, especially when you're trying to get pregnant. We call yeah. it performance anxiety. And I also think there's probably people in relationships that they're maybe not 100% attracted yeah. to their partner, or maybe they're attracted to men, but married to a woman. Yeah, there could um, be other reasons, yeah, that are at play. Yeah, for sure. So it doesn't matter to me what the reason is. Yeah. Obviously, my job yeah. is to yeah. get people pregnant. And there's yeah. no, you know, there's no judgment on my side or yeah. shame. I mean, I think people feel a lot, there's a lot of feelings associated with like the inability to reproduce, as you know, right? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, we focused, focused a lot and it's gotten much better about the shame of infertility or taboo topic of infertility and females and egg producing partners. But there, we don't, there's still a taboo around the, the male part and the sperm producing partner, because that's definitely not discussed as much. And we've kind of lifted the the lid off of what mm-hmm. you know people such as myself have gone through as far as infertility goes. But you know, talking about the type of things you just mentioned with a sperm producing individual, uh, that's really still not talked about. Uh, and I'm sure us talking about it right now is, I mean, I, I haven't had heard any of these types of discussions. So maybe this needs to be talked about more because there could be um, psychological factors at play. There could be social factors at play. It could be mm-hmm. based on how they identify or what their sexual preferences are that could all affect a reason why an individual uh, cannot perform or ejaculate or whatever. And if that's the case, it's okay to talk about it. I mean, talking to someone like Dr. Rogers about it. And I'm sure, I'm sure there's plenty of times when you're doing these conversations without the other partner in the room, right? Yeah. It's important you know, to have that, that safety. Yeah. Yes. I think yeah, obviously if, if it's, you know, partners know when there's problems, because I will tell you, I have a good number of my patients who that's the only reason they're coming to see me because they can't have yeah. intercourse. And sometimes it's on the female side, there's vaginismus, prior trauma, yeah. all kinds of things, right? And sometimes it's on the guy side. And sometimes it's both. I will also say that trying to get pregnant puts a certain stress yeah. on sex. Absolutely. And I, I think on, I did discuss this a little bit on Valentine's Day at I, I did a post on Instagram, like that was a little like opening up like a little mm-hmm. bit of real personal stuff because it was really like sex was definitely not in, in like, you know, an awesome, wonderful, like oh, wonderful, like in love thing when you're like, okay, I'm ovulating today. We got to do it. Yes. Right. Um, it becomes yeah. really a chore and a lot of work. Mm-hmm. And I think that, um, and the, the post was about how once you're done with trying to get pregnant, sex can go back to being fun. But I think yeah. that there's a lot of stress that on both the female absolutely. and the male side about sort yeah. of performing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. For, and for an, any number of reasons. And then, you know, we're going to jump into secondary infertility. But I, I wanted to talk about male factor infertility because it's simply not talked about enough. And not to place blame on those individuals. But like I said, we've opened up and, and social media has allowed with female factor infertility and egg producing individual uh, infertility and just infertility in general, we talk about it a lot. Not so much the the counterpart with the male factor and sperm producing individual infertility. So we need to, we need to make that less taboo as well. And this is my effort because I get questions a lot. I'm not a reproductive endocrinologist. People still think that I am and I'm not, but I want to talk about it. Because you're so good. <laughs> well, you I, know I, so much. No, I, I'm going to find, if I don't know the answer, I'll find somebody that does. I'll direct, the, I'll direct them to your account a lot actually. And, uh, you know, it's, we just need to talk about it and it's okay to talk about it. Um, it's, it's still, uh, there's still t- a taboo nature around it. And, and this is an effort to try to lift that and not make it quite as taboo because there's so many things that can go around that can be involved with uh, male factor infertility. Um, just, we just spent a whole half an hour talking about it. So clearly there are multiple factors at play that could be a reason why an individual or a couple, an individual or a couple is not able to get pregnant. Right. Okay. So let's jump into secondary infertility. Uh, I've been getting, I don't know why, a lot of questions about this recently. So first, what is the definition of secondary infertility? So a secondary infertility is infertility in a patient who was previously able to conceive. So does that go that, both ways? Does that go both? That goes both ways before egg and sperm producing individuals, correct? Yeah, I think so. Obviously, okay. I'm usually seeing people as either an individual as, yeah. or a couple. So somebody yeah. who was able to get pregnant before and now having a hard time getting pregnant, that is what we call secondary infertility. So we know that they were fertile, but now they're not fertile. 
And this includes people who have never used fertility or assisted reproductive technology. They were able to conceive spontaneously on their own. Right. Is that so, right? But the, here, so, uh, you know, yeah. here's the thing. Yeah. So it, like, okay. if you had someone who used, like my patients who got pregnant with fertility treatment, but they've been pregnant before, they're not really primary infertility. Like you're either primary mm -hmm. or secondary. So I yeah. still call those patients secondary, even though they needed yeah. help before, but they did get pregnant with help. Okay. So I think gotcha. that's probably the inclusive okay. definition. Now, is there a time period of trying that needs to be met before having a diagnosis of secondary infertility? So if you have not had a diagnosis of infertility before, then mm -hmm. usually we say six months of trying if you're 35 and older or okay. 12 months of trying if you're under 35, so 34 okay. or younger. Now, okay. if, you've, if you had to go through the whole gamut, including whatever treatment, seeing a fertility doctor, getting on meds, whatever it was, um, then you don't have to like wait that a second time. Mm -hmm. So if you have a prior history of infertility, yeah. probably just go back to what worked for your treatment before. The first time, okay. And then as far as how common it is, I've I heard, read one place that it said it was, it was as common as primary infertility, and then another place that said it was about 10%. Is yeah, it somewhere I'm in between? I'm not sure. It's probably yeah. somewhere in between. Yeah. We know that yeah. sort of one in eight couples suffer from, you know, infertility in general. Mm -hmm. And I think that I do see a lot of both. Um, certainly a lot of reasons. I will say I had secondary infertility. I had my first mm -hmm. child when I was a resident. I literally got pregnant the first month I was trying. And then, mm -hmm. you know, it took me four years plus multiple miscarriages, plus mm -hmm. multiple IVF cycles to have my second one. And... Mm -hmm. You know, so I was like a, a very classic example of, yeah. you know, primary infertility. And I think that there's a lot that goes into, you know, obviously also with the next child that you're trying to have, you're also older. I was, yeah. I was like yeah. 31. I was not old at the time. But, you know, you're also older so that, you know, that plays a role into your ability to be successful also. Okay. And then about one third of cases originate with the egg producing partner, one third originate in the sperm producing partner, and then the other third is a combination or unknown. Does that sound right. about right? Yeah. 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 Okay. So let's just jump into some of the, what are some of the causes? The first one I have there is like you just touched on, uh, and I see this a lot and I'm babies after 35 guru here. They, uh, an individual uh, may have been with one partner, had one or two kids or even more when they were uh, younger. Fast forward, they are with a second partner or a new partner in a new relationship, and they're trying, they're now older, and they cannot get pregnant. Um, so definitely age is going to be one of the causes of secondary infertility. Why is that? So as we go, we're born with all the eggs mm -hmm. we're ever going to have. And as we go through life, we lose both the quantity of eggs we have plus the quality. Most women lose the ability for their eggs to make a child somewhere around 42, 43, 44, typically. Mm -hmm. And we have to think about the fact that most women aren't done menstruating. You mm -hmm. know, they're not out of eggs that they're, they're ovulating until 51-ish. Mm -hmm. And so there is a time period that women are, in, you know, all women are ovulating and may not have healthy eggs. And the hard mm -hmm. part is that, you know, there's no test, there's no way that we can sort of identify if the eggs that you have inside you are healthy or not. Yeah. And so, you know, as we get older, fewer percentage of our eggs have that ability to make yeah. a baby, and we have fewer number. And yeah. some women, most people lose that ability 42, 43, 44. But yeah. there's a lot of people who lose that ability much earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have to consider even though an individual has had a uh, one, two, three kids in their late 20s, mid 20s, when they try again with that second relationship, and I'm just using this as an example, but it can happen even with the same partner. Um, yep. You know, I, I get messages all the time. Uh, I just, I'm in a new relationship. I'm 40 and I, I have three kids and now I can't, and they, it just totally escapes them that age is a factor. So we have to consider that. Yeah. And, you know, that's one of the most common causes of secondary infertility. And then also problems with the fallopian tubes. If, for example, you had, a child before, then maybe after that had an ectopic that may have damaged the tubes or anything else. What are some of the other things that could have damaged your tubes in between pregnancies to cause secondary infertility? Yeah. So we think about things like endometriosis, yeah, yes, uh, yeah. appendicitis that, you know, where there's other mm -hmm. inflammation in the pelvis. And the other thing that's really common actually is issues with the uterus where yeah. somebody yes. grows fibroids. I mean, 70% of us have yeah. fibroids, 70% yes. of 70% of women, uh, people who have a uterus, 
uh, have fibroids, you know, sometime mm -hmm. in their life and yeah. fibroids can cause issues with the ability to get and stay pregnant. And so, you know, there's other structural abnormalities that certainly can happen with, with, uh, fallopian tubes and the uterus. Yeah. Now also along with the uterus, multiple C-sections, I've seen that, uh, a few C-sections yes. earlier on and it, a C-section is still surgery on the uterus, just like if you had a fibroid removed or if you've had a uh, DNCs in the past, um, for whatever reason, whether it's from having a miscarriage and needing a DNC or having a postpartum hemorrhage and retained placenta and need a needing a DNC, those are all risk factors for getting uh, scar tissue within the uterine cavity. So that's something to consider as well. Um, now, I hear this all the time. You cut out there for a second. I missed that. Can you hear me? Sorry, uh -oh. I got paused there. Breastfeeding, you said breastfeeding. As a cause. Yeah, as a cause of secondary infertility. Is that a thing? It It is a thing. Okay. Um, so I actually, you know, I do this podcast, Be Infertility, which is a fantastic mm -hmm. podcast. We've been doing it for six years. And we just recorded an episode, which will, should air this Friday, about luteal phase defects. What's and the name of the, wait, real quick. What's the name of it's the It's called podcast? Beat Infertility, B-E-A-T. And um, they're on Instagram. I usually will post, uh, okay. you know, when they when there's new episodes. Good. Okay. Um, and and it's a great podcast that sort mm -hmm. of reviews patient stories, but also sort of medical stuff. And we just did an episode on luteal phase defects, which is where that second part of your cycle, where between the time you ovulate and the time you get your period, is really short, and, and does that cause infertility? And you know, when you're nursing you don't have, you know, the prolactin that you're producing when you're nursing mm -hmm. disrupts the pulsatility of what we call uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone, which then disrupts pulsatility of your FSH, your follicle stimulating hormone. So you're not sending those signals down to your ovary quite in that pulsatile manner. And you either are not ovulating or as your baby starts stretching out feeding, skipping feedings, usually like at night and stuff, or um, situations where you have, you know, your baby starting to eat food and, and nursing less, then you often will get your period back. But a lot of times when you first get your period back, your cycles are, you know, short, a little weird, mm -hmm. maybe not ovulatory. Um, I will say when I was trying for my third and I was nursing and I, you know, had ovulation, I was like, could tell you I was ovulating. And then literally four days later, got my period. I like, called up my co-fellow at the time. I was a fertility fellow. And I was like, I don't even think it's possible to have a four day luteal phase. And he was like, mm. you're, nur you're nursing. Actually, that's totally possible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, it, you know, that nursing does disrupt the hormones. And I think sort of evolutionarily, when you're mm. producing calories and energy yeah. to support the development of an yeah. infant, you know, your body does make another baby at that time. So that's sort of how our bodies have, have evolved to um, really support and the baby that we have, you know, the yeah. infant that we have that we're helping feed. Yeah, well, that all makes sense. So I, I, I get that question a lot too. I'm breastfeeding, why can't I get pregnant? And I'm like, hmm. now I don't explain that as eloquently as you just did. But now I have a video to refer them to. So that there you go. Exactly I will also happening. say you cannot rely on on, on nursing as birth control right so although i will say if you're exclusively nursing and nursing every three hours around the clock which i will say is exhausting um when you're nursing around the clock for the first six months before baby's eating food it is very effective but it's not a hundred percent yeah it's so it's what we call exclusive breastfeeding so exclusive breastfeeding right. for sure is going to have a lower chance of failing but once you start feeding and not exclusively breastfeeding uh, the percent chance that it's not going to be effective is, is going to go up. So that's something to consider. Um, okay, let's get to uh, what I wanted to talk about next. Uh, and this is a good topic. As far as secondary infertility and even uh, sperm producing or egg producing factor of uh, infertility, um, partner infertility, um, let's talk a little bit about, I've heard about sexual lubricants and some sexual, sexual lubricants that can be toxic. And this even environmental type toxins, what, what, do, what do we know about that? Yeah, so great question. So from a lubricant perspective, um, lubricants can be really helpful for intimacy and, yeah. um, you know, uh, they are great from that perspective, but they can 
uh, kill sperm. And a lot of sort of lubricants also have spermicide in them, which is not helpful. They did do a study and this study was done, boy, I would say 15, 20 years ago on different lubricants and how toxic they were to sperm. And in that, in that study, the lubricant precede was found to be least toxic. Now, if you like things like saliva also can be disruptive to sperm, right? Because there's all these enzymes, sal- yeah, salivary yeah. enzymes and stuff, right? So you like really like there's all kinds of things, uh, you know, canola oil or coconut oil. Like there's all things like really nothing is best. Yeah. If yeah. you can go with nothing, nothing. Uh, good old foreplay, that is fantastic. The best lubrication is natural lubrication. If you're really having trouble or, you know, you are really uncomfortable and your partner is not finishing yet uh, and you need something, then precede is certainly one of them. There's a couple others on the market. I haven't seen any like data data about them yet, but precede is one. Um, and I'll be honest, I cannot remember if that's one that's available. Like a lot of times I'll stop at Target and check out, see what it's, you know, available, you know, at an easily findable store. But I know that, you know, Amazon certainly and other options mm-hmm. can help you with that. But you got to be yeah. really careful with lubricants. So while we're on this topic, and this isn't something I told you I was going to ask you, but we're going to talk about it. Um, is there anything that helps as far as lubrication that helps you to get pregnant? Because I, so I love social media. Of course I do. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for social media. But the FDA just came down on several companies who were marketing supplements, lubes, all this stuff that would increase your chances of getting pregnant. They got in yeah. trouble because real of big trouble. Bullshit. Yeah. And right. I, and I, it blows my mind. And I, you, you probably know Dr. Rogers, I, I, am very evidence-based and I, I can't Me stand too. when any company is targeting that particular population of individuals who are trying to conceive or have experienced infertility. And they're saying, take this pill. It's going to cure everything. The FDA is starting to come after these companies. So all of, and now there's also a male fertility support, a pill that you're supposed to take that's supposed to fix everything. Please explain where I'm going with yes. this. What do you say as a fertility specialist about these types of products? So this is certainly something that you, I would encourage everyone to ask their either OBGYN or fertility a reproductive endocrinologist about sort of what is the right thing for you. Now, thing, there are some over-the-counter treatments that are helpful to, to sort of boost your fertility or give you sort of the best chances possible, but a lot of it is baloney. So there is no like lubricant or anything else, um, you know, intimacy products that will help boost your fertility, just period. Um, but from a supplement perspective, there are some things that can help with sort of sperm and egg production. And, and how I sort of say is like, it's not going to give you healthy eggs, but it'll help support the growth of those healthy eggs. Mm -hmm. Um, and those things involve supplements. And I definitely talked to your doctor before starting to take supplements, but of course, things like folic acid, that's not going to boost your fertility, but it's going to decrease your risk of, um, miscarriage of, uh, sorry, birth defects. We yeah. think about things like CoQ10. Now, there's some yeah. good evidence-based medicine about CoQ10. It's been shown to help with heart health, which is nice because you can find it at literally any drugstore you go to. Um, and there's, you know, all kinds of it. You can find it at Costco and Target and anywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. And usually I say 400 milligrams for men, 600 for women. And there's some good evidence. It's a strong antioxidant. It can certainly help with sort of sperm production and egg production. So that's one that I like a lot. It has really like no side effects, no downsides, and there's good evidence based around it. I think there's a lot of other supplements that have sort of not amazing, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, evidence around them. I will say there's some antioxidants that can be found in a regular men's multivitamin, like a regular once a day. Yeah, just a multivitamin. Yeah. 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 You know, a little calcium, a little vitamin C and zinc and Mm -hmm. some of this other stuff that's in this whole, like a whole, you know, regular men's multivitamin. So I don't think you need to go fan, you know, do anything fancy. Certainly don't take any like (laughs) testosterone boosting supplements or anything like that. Yeah. But just be careful. All of these with the pretty packaging, the pretty ads, all the influencers on social media that have no medical background that are pushing these supplements. You you first uh, talk to someone like Dr. Rogers about their opinion on this. Most of these are a bunch of it's just advertising and it's nothing different than what you can get from a prenatal vitamin or a vitamin just for a a, a male vitamin or 
it's not any different. All it is, it's more expensive. The advertising is yep. prettier and you have an influencer with 500,000 followers telling you to take it. Right. So, that's why the FDA and I applaud them for this because they came down on them and that show, that's showing you that there's companies that are taking advantage of individuals who are vulnerable because they're trying to get pregnant and which is saying And I not think right. there's a lot of preying on yes. people who are feeling hopeless. Exactly. Exactly. And also, what also pisses me off is that if you don't take this, then you're failing as an individual, or you're not wanting to do the best thing for your pregnancy. That's the other message that it sends, which I, which I have a huge problem with, especially as someone that did go through infertility and you did too, mm -hmm. you, you know, you feel like you would do anything. And if this vitamin and, or supplements telling you, you need to take this yep. to do the best for your health, then you're going to feel guilty if you don't, but by the right. way, you pay $90 a month for this subscription. No. Right. I, yeah. Okay. So that's my two cents on that. And but, how, I mean, how many companies approach you? Yeah. Shannon, oh, and ask I, to like, I, I well, you, sure I mean, as many as you, and I have my weed out question for all of them and 99%. That? That's why, and you know what my weed out question Send me the are. evidence. Gonna, <laughs> that's what I always all, say. I'm like, send if me they the have evidence. anything other than if it's prenatal attached to it, and it has methylfolate. That's my weed out question. That's all I'll say about that. So, you know, it's, uh, but you know, you do too. And I, mm -hmm. you know, that's why I don't support any of them. You know, I'm not, it has to be to, something that's like, yeah. You know, yeah. I think that, I mean, you and I, this is not our, you know, being on social media, we do, yeah. I mean, obviously you have your reasons and I have my reasons, but like yeah. I do to make sure the number one reason is mainly yeah. to make sure that patients are educated yeah. with actual scientific information because there's so much misinformation on social yes. media. And it and, empowers them. It empowers them because they have accurate information and they know what questions to ask their own physicians and they know what not to fall for here on social media. Uh, I, and I'm sure you went through it too. Uh, you know, I, you're a professional, you're a professor. Why are you on social media? That's so unprofessional. Like it or not, people are getting their medical information on social media. They are. So as long as they have individuals like myself and you and us, countless others that we know, we yeah. have this little community, especially in the OBGYN world, yeah. uh, that are pushing out evidence-based information. We're not here for the followers. We're not here for the money. We're here to give you information right. to empower you. And, and it, it, that's why we're here. Right. So, it's not our day you know, job. It's a labor of it's love. Not our, <laughs> it's not our day job. No, it's not. It's, it's not my day job. I, I wish I could, you know, I wish it's, it's, it's not your night job either. Day job. <laughs> well, right. So, but anyway, let's see, when you have nine minutes, I'm going to see if there's any cool questions for you to ask, answer. Somebody let's said see. thoughts on CoQ10. I just said, I love CoQ10. Uh, there's very little downside. It's a great antioxidant for general health. Yeah, you mentioned it. Mm -hmm. And here's one. We're wondering about how acrosome defects develop in male factor. Have had two previous pregnancies with letrozole. Son passed at 27 weeks of E. coli after P. prom and 22 months old daughter. What do you know what that question is asking? So like the acrosome is the like very tip of the, the sperm has these acids inside it, these enzymes to digest the outer part of the egg. Uh, okay. The zona pellucida, they have to like, this acrosomal yes. reaction has to happen to like get in and sort of eat through the egg. I, my guess is that they said there's some issue with sort of the sperm. And, and that's where IVF can be really helpful, where we inject okay. sperm into the egg. Um, that's ex and, ICSI, right? Mm -hmm, because it really sort of takes away, you know, the, the need for sperm to, to do much on, on their own, except yeah. for donate the DNA. Okay. Uh, we already talked about zero sperm. The most common cause of zero of azo is it called azospermia, mm -hmm. or is that is is it from a congenital defect in the reproductive tract? Is that what's I the think, most common cause? I think the most common cause that I see is typically some sort of like undiagnosed, unknown, probably genetic testicular mm -hmm. failure. So okay. we have got like just like ovarian failure where the ovaries stop functioning you can have testicular yeah. failure. You see the same okay. hormone profile, high FSH levels. Um, and that's probably okay. the most common. Most common. Um, okay. Unfortunately, it's the hardest to treat because it's not like you can just go into the testicles yeah. if the testicles are not responding to the hormones, right. but okay. there's a lot we can do. Okay. Husband has abnormal morphology. Urologist says that he has a varicocele and IUI is a good option. Says not to treat until we're done having children. Would you agree? I there's guess a not lot to treat of, the varicocele. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of controversy about varicoceles. So the reason to treat them is so the varicocele doesn't get worse. Uh, treating a varicocele may not improve sperm counts. If you're 
getting it treated with like a fertility urologist or someone who does a lot of this, it shouldn't really decrease, but it may not improve the sperm counts. But if they think that sperm counts are good enough for insemination, that's mm-hmm. pretty good. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think that, you know, there's a lot of controversy about varicoseals and how much they help. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, how much treating them or do they mm-hmm. start not removing them? them? How do you? Remove yeah, varicose. they'll do a varicocele ectomy where they mm-hmm. will remove the varicocele, uh, and it's mainly just sort of a plexus of, of you know, varicose vein, vein. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. mainly on the left, and they'll remove it. But there is some controversy because a lot of times the damage that it has caused doesn't, mm-hmm. you know, it's it doesn't already, change. Yeah, it's already there. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, so it doesn't necessarily improve sperm counts, but those are also scenarios where, you know, varicoseles can get worse. You can freeze sperm mm-hmm. ahead of time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Are males being treated for ADHD with Adderall at risk? I have not heard anything about Adderall specifically being an effector. Mm-mm. No, Mm-mm. I haven't heard it. Yeah. For women Same. either, it's not recommended in pregnancy, um, but, you know. Well, actually, there's there's some newer data coming out. It's just hard to study because you don't have yeah. a lot. But we're getting more data uh, on that, actually. I've posted some. Like lower doses. About infant, yeah, lower doses, Adderall, those types of medications. I, it's under my medications highlight uh, on, my, on my account. I'm going to go check it out. Uh, uh, what is the possibility of getting pregnant naturally at 44 years for a woman and husband if the husband's 32? Pretty unlikely, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I when... never say never. Never say never, but the chances are much lower at, at 44. It's just yeah, I definitely. See. Yeah, yeah. I would, if you're 44, I would head directly to a reproductive endocrinologist. I would do everything you can. Like I said, most women lose that ability for their eggs to make, uh, you know, a healthy child somewhere around that 42, 43, 44. So I would head right to a fertility specialist, see, be as aggressive as you can afford, uh, and do everything you can to see if you can have a healthy baby. And if you, if there's not healthy eggs, there's all their ways to family build as, as Shan- Shannon knows, um, all of the awesome family building yeah. options that we have for patients who unfortunately don't have eggs that can, yeah. that can yeah. make a healthy baby. Yeah. And this is going to be the last question. What is the likelihood of conceiving naturally or spontaneously after facing primary infertility for your first two children? I, I'm sure there's not a stat that you have a 25%, but you hear all the time that someone, an individual or a couple required fertility treatments, uh, even IVF, and then yeah. spontaneously yeah, pregnant And I think that the main reason for that is because people are not like truly infertile, they're subfertile, right? Mm -hmm. And so their chances are less than the average person, but they're not zero, right? Unless like the Mm -hmm. tubes are blocked, or really, there's no sperm or something like that. So Mm -hmm. I think that part of it is going to depend on how many more children you want, how old you are right now, in terms of how long you want to wait and try on your own. I, yeah. I think that if you're trying on your own for six months and it's still not happening, probably a good yeah. time to sort of get the evaluation. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there's, I think there's always holding out that hope that you hear about the stories of requiring IVF or anything similar, and then bam, getting pregnant spontaneously. And it, it's probably not as common as it might seem. Uh, I'm sure it does happen, but it's the, ex- would, would you say it's the exception rather than the rule? Most of the times if you're requiring I, I, you know, something like IVF, uh, for Usually we go back to what yeah. worked, what, what worked before, right? Uh, but mm-hmm. again, I never say never. I stopped saying ne- never. Yeah, these patients ago. who say, "I was told <laughs> yeah. I could never get pregnant," or like, some, yeah, it's yeah. like, what? Yeah. Who yes, says this? Yes. Where are these doctors coming I, from? Especially the ones that have endometriosis, a PCOS, when they're teens, early twenties, yes. you're never going to get pregnant. Uh, it boils my. It, it burns me up when I hear that, uh, which is a totally not. And then you you label that person or they carry that weight with them for so long. Yeah. And it's totally unfair to say that to anyone, actually, especially when they're young. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure you've seen many cases like that. Uh, I'm sure. OK, yeah. well, I'm going to get you out of here two minutes early. Tell people where they can find you on social media. Sure. So on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, it's at dr.ellison.rogers. Uh, also, my practice website is fcionline.com. And then real quick, you do some things with your kids. Tell them because you're not only talking about fertility. And oh, yeah. Function. yeah. Talk about that. Yeah. So I only really include my oldest daughter because she's the only you have to be 13 to be on TikTok. Oh, okay. And okay. so she's my only one that's over 13. So okay. but we I do a series called Teen Talk, which I mean, I think it's not only for teens, it's probably anybody could really listen yeah, and, and get yeah. some information. Yes. Um, but we sort of talk about periods, um, tampons, menstrual cycles, puberty, sort of all things mm-hmm. growing up. 
Um, and like questions that you always wanted to know, like, mm -hmm. I think I published one this week that was like, does your doctor care about pubic hair? And yes, of course, the is, no, that. we don't yeah. care. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of a fun, um, yeah. a fun thing. Uh, I really, my daughter is for sure going to be a future doctor. She just doesn't, yeah. she's like, I don't want to do anything with vaginas, <laughs> but <laughs> I think, that's okay, <laughs> that's fine. There's lots of other yeah. pathways. Um, but she is really interested in health and science and education. So, um, yeah. someone said, so say hi to Lily. Yeah, so I, I brought that up because it is a good resource, especially if you have teenage children to listen oh, to those those talk talks because I think they're they're really helpful. So well, you know what that. happened pre COVID, I, my my daughter's yeah. friends would be over and they'd be like, "Can we ask you some questions?" Yeah. And I I realized that like you know they felt comfortable asking me questions, and I think part of that is because I have a very good relationship with my daughter, and um, they didn't necessarily feel comfortable talking to their parents about some of these things mm -hmm. because they were embarrassed. And I also felt like yeah. as a group, they were able to like ask embarrassing questions as a group that may not yeah. be, like you might not feel comfortable answering one-on-one. -on -one. And so we were like, I bet there's so many people out there, yeah. young adults who don't yeah. know this information, nobody's sitting them down and talking to them about it. And so well, that's really how we started. So much false things on social media. <laughs> about for teenagers yes. so sometimes I just like ah so you can definitely go at, at Lily and Dr. Rogers to get some accurate information and other teen talk uh, episodes so I appreciate your time and I appreciate all your work you are yeah, a you too go follow Dr. Rogers uh, Allison Rogers on all the social media she has the same handle which is excellent so and I'll put it under the in the caption on this video on my Instagram feed awesome have a great rest of your day and rest of your week awesome you too thank you so much for having me you're welcome bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.